we um, decided we'd do tonight for you is we would um, each um, speak for about 10 minutes and we would also, uh, at the end of our 10 minutes, uh, do a bit of cross-chat um, and, and um, converse um, and we would do this for about 40 minutes and then we would throw it open to you. Um, each of us has um, chosen a couple of stories as our particular focus um, and uh, that should at least give us um, some place to start from. Um, my own particular uh, stories are The Fall of the House of Usher uh, and the um, Cask of Amontillado. And I'm um, just going to make sure I don't get over time here. But, um, so let me talk a little f about the Cask of Amontillado to start with. Um, my, the point I wanted to make about Poe was how enormously influential he's been, how so many of the ideas that he floated in these short stories um, have been taken up and used by uh, great writers in the 19th and the 20th century. Um, so let me illustrate that by talking about one aspect of the uh, cask of Amontillado um, by uh, an, an enormous and powerful feat of memory. I've, I've uh, uh, committed to um, to memory the uh, first line of this story, <laughs> <laughs> which, which goes as follows. Um, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, um, but when he ventured upon insult, uh, I vowed revenge. <laughs> now, you know, there's a, that, that lovely sequence of V's at the end, he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. But I think the most interesting word in that opening sentence is the word injuries. He says, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had best, I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon an insult, which means that the thousand injuries were somehow less than <laughs> insult. So, so what were they? They must have been slights, maybe, or innuendos. Um, whatever they were, they were enough to um, push this man, a narrator, whose name is Montresor, um, to take his revenge uh, uh, upon Fortunato, who's actually very unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Montresor has a, a palazzo in Venice, uh, and in his vaults he apparently has a new cask of Amontillado, uh, and he tells Fortunato that he needs somebody to come and, and evaluate it for him. But he um, he's very cunning. He says to uh, he says to Fortunato, but, but the air's not good down there, and I think, I think so and so. I think our friend so and so, uh, I would probably ask him. It would be better if he, if he I know he's not as good as you, but, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and which of course makes Fortunato insist that nobody, it could only be him. Nobody can evaluate a Montegardo like he can. And so in this way, he's lured into the vaults of, uh, of Montreux's palazzo. Uh, and deeper and deeper, Montrose or Lewis, and so the air is so bad that uh, a candle cannot, uh, can barely uh, stay alight. Uh, at which point he manacles him to the wall uh, and bricks him up. Uh, and so we have an instance there of, um, uh, well, I'll just point to the paranoia that is clearly a facet of, uh, of Montrose's. Um, personality or pathology. Um, and here's the theme of, of premature burial that is uh, visited uh, frequently elsewhere in Poe's fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but what, um, what struck me, uh, I think, on about the seventh reading of this story um, was that as you begin to read it, you are caught up in the voice of Montresor in this rather silky but very mad voice as mm -hmm. he walks to you, tells you what he's doing with Fortunato. And the voice doesn't let you go until either you throw the book to one side or you finish the story or you die. Mm -hmm. 
in the family. <laughs> so in a sense, you have been bricked up in the story just mm -hmm. as Montresor has. There is no escape. You are caught within the, uh, the, this, this construction of, of the narrator. Um, and it's an idea that I've found uh, elsewhere, whether it is a direct influence of Poe, but um, I don't know if anybody still reads John Hawkes, but he wrote a wonderful novel called Travesty, in which uh, mm. uh, a young man is in a car with his lover and his lover's father, and they're driving across France at great speed, and he has uh, told them that he's going to drive this car into a wall uh, uh, at the end of the night. And then he explains why he's going to destroy all three of them. Um, uh, and it's all quite, quite mad. Um, but there is no escape for them. And there is no escape for the reader either. And uh, it uh, occurred to me that John must have read The Cast of Amontillado uh, and incorporated this idea into his own scheme for uh, a, you know, a homicide or a maniac who has managed to get his victim into a restricted uh, uh, space in which he intends to uh, do him in. Um, so that's um, uh, just a, a, a few uh, remarks on the cast of Amontillado. Um, I'll just say one or two things about um, uh, the fall of the House of Usher uh, and then pick up the theme of uh, premature burial. Poe po actually wrote a story called The Premature Burial. Um, it's an idea, it's an anxiety that was around through most of the 19th century, but I don't think anybody uh, other than Poe would have thought to actually write a story from the point of view of somebody who has been prematurely buried. Um, but that's what he does. Uh, it's called The Premature Burial, and you might think it's an impossible story for how could it have uh, survived. Um, but in point of fact, Poe uh, very cleverly uh, um, creates an ending to the story that I won't call it a happy ending, but it's, um, it's a somewhat hopeful sort of an ending. But clearly, uh, um, uh, premature burial was um, very much uh, a concern of his, an anxiety of his, as it was so many people in the 19th century. Uh, and in the, uh, the fall of the House of Usher, there is uh, a wonderful moment where um, our narrator has, been, uh, has come to visit his old friend Roderick Usher, who lives in, in this ancient old pile that sits in a piece of gloomy moorland. Uh, reflected in a black tar. Uh, and he goes in and he finds his old friend, his sort of long haired and deteriorated, and he's gone quite mad in his isolation. But he shares the house of Russia with his sister Madeline, Roderick and Madeline, who looks just like him and is just as mad as him. And we see her only once as she's crossing back of the chamber that uh, Roderick uh, inhabits uh, there. Uh, and the next we know is that Roderick tells him she's dead, she's died. So that's the end of Madeline. <laughs> uh, uh, but then one evening, a few evenings later, we the, the pair of them hear this extraordinary hideous sound. It sounds like somebody tearing wood to pieces. <laughs> and God returns to the narrator and tells him, I buried her alive in the tomb. <laughs> and, and that's Madeline trying to get out. <laughs> and then a little later, there's footsteps. And then there's a knock on the door. And the door opens, and there is Madeline, and she falls on top of Roderick and carries him to the ground a corpse. <laughs> um, and so this is a feature of um, uh, the fall of the House of Usher. It's almost the, uh, the, the final event of, of the story. Um, but that's just to show you how the, uh, the theme of premature burial is threaded through uh, Poe's work. And there it pops up again. Um, and um, well, I think, I think that's about 10 minutes. So I'll stop there. And you, you two can insult me now. <laughs> No, I'm impressed. I'm a, I can't insult you. Um, I, I, I like the fall of the House of Usher rather more than I like the Cask of Amontillado, which seems in some way a little programmatic. 
That is, it's about one thing, and it does that one thing, and then, and then it's done, you know. In fact, um, Fortunato's even dead before he gets him uh, worked up in there. I don't know about that, Peter. Are you sure? Well, does I he don't, say that? I don't think he says it. No, I think, I think uh, he, he's still sort of clamoring for mercy, even as the last brick no, is, is put in place. <laughs> <laughs> so he keeps saying, uh, well, Right before the end, the guy's yelling, for the love of God, Montessori, and he says, yes, for the love of God. <laughs> Fortunato, I call him again. Fortunato. Uh, no answer. Still. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. My heart was sick. Yes, uh, well, that's, yes. After the last Fortunato, it's, he's certainly not talking anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> he's a Don't you find it interesting that, um, the fact that we don't really even know what this insult was that, that you know, that and he, what's interesting to me about Poe in general is what he chooses to leave out mm. rather, you know, rather than what he, he can write the most rapturous detailed descriptions that the description of, um, of Roderick is so, I keep remembering his luminous eyes and his, yes. and, his and the way his mouth is, is yes. um, but, and, <clears throat> and, he, and he will detail something to death, but then, then other things he won't include at all. And I just think that's yes. fascinating. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I think it just bespeaks the, the utter paranoia yeah. of, of this man. If we knew, it would be so trivial. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, that it would probably right. become laughable. But yeah. I think that's the assumption we have to make. Um, what do you make of the uh, text in the middle of uh, the, the fall, the House of Usher? It's very interesting, I think. Um, this, this long poem. Oh, yes. Um, which completely predicts everything that's going to happen. Um, do you know, I don't remember what it is. I think I skipped it when I read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe you'll have to tell you me. You have something to talk about. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's very strange that so in the midst of this, you know, intense uh, to me, um, very beautiful story, everything slows down yeah. and stops, and and he, oh, there it is, yes. Of, it's, yes, in the greenest of our valleys, by good and what, what angels tended. Oh, well, I have a different edition. We each have a different edition. Of the Anyhow, it's this, it's this long romantic poem, but it does predict every single thing yes, of that, that happens after that. And I think that is when, when I read that, I thought that's not the first time whoever did that. People are always turning the old text. It's not quite as um, prevalent as it is in Lovecraft, but 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 it happens a lot and. I think this has to do with the idea of the authority of the text. Mm -hmm. If you bring the text up into the surface, something's going to happen in the world. Mm -hmm. And also it gives weight to what happens in the world if, if you can read it all in some book before. Uh -huh. So it sort of validates what happens in the story. I think so. It's already there in an old poem. Yeah. yeah. He does the same thing in the assignation, actually. Yeah, yeah he does. There's a long poem in the middle of that, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting, and you're a lot of times you're inclined to skip the poem just to get some good stuff. But, well, yeah. <laughs> right on the of the day, I always <laughs> but it's like Hamlet, you know. Everything slows down. You see this uh, uh, little performance thing, and then it goes yes, back yes, and yes, it does yes, what. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Poe is uh, making a reference to Hamlet. Um, it is a really interesting device, though. Have you ever thought of putting a poem in the middle of one of your oh, chapters in your books? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. Um, so he had no copyright problems, clearly. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah everybody's stealing from everybody else. Yeah. I also thought it was interesting that uh, Montresor's family motto kind of condemns him to the uh, paranoia and lethal revenge that he exacts on uh, his buddy there. It's in Latin. It's Nemo me impune lacasit, which I took the trouble looking up. Yes. And it means no one attacks me with impunity. With impunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it's sort of the par you that par right. paranoid's motto. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> Just, 
Well, speaking of paranoia, um, I chose Telltale Heart, which is um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> quite quite the, the ultimate of that, and and just you know something that I read really you know early on in my life that really influenced me and that I was, I was absolutely terrified by and continue to be. Um, the thing that interests me about Poe, that's always interested me about him, is almost all of his stories take place in absolute darkness. Whether it's you know going down into a tunnel or it, at night in Venice, this is the ultimate darkness because it's inside the mind of a psychotic murderer. So how much darker can you possibly get than that? Um, right from the very beginning of the Telltale Heart, we are aware of this incredibly strong, mad voice, kind of like Casca Amontillado. Um, True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I have been and am, but why will you say I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. So you've got your, your ultimate you know, madman here, and you're along for the ride, and you're in his mind. Um, interestingly, although Poe seems to be one for, um, you know, very detailed descriptions, in the Telltale Heart, we get very few, except for the eye of the oh. man who is his landlord. That is, that's, to me, that's another character in the story. He doesn't hate the man. In fact, you know, on a daily basis when he talks to him, or, or you know, he's, he actually loves him, he says, but his eye, that's what he really hates. Um, he, it's his hawk-like eye. I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. So you have two guys uh, whose names you don't know, who aren't physically described, and this eye. Those are really the main characters in the story. Um, so you have him watching him in darkness, this old man, for seven days um, I, and in the dark. Uh, and you have this from the point of view of the stalker, which is really terrifying. And he says that he undid the lantern just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. I did this for seven long nights, every night just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. Makes perfect sense. Uh, so then on the eighth night, um, we have the introduction of sounds, um, something that takes place in such darkness, and yet sounds are so vividly described which is a, you know, sort of a foreshadowing of this heart, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was a groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. Yeah. I knew the sound well, you know. So, and this thrills him because he knows the old man is awake. Um, he proceeds to shine his lantern very cautiously on the eye, and lo and behold, it was open, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones, but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damn spot. So this guy's doomed, absolutely doomed. There's no, you know, it's this eye, he's gonna put an end to an eye, he proceeds to, you know, bludgeon him to death, um, and then, one of the really, really interesting things to me about this story, I, I teach a workshop here at, at Crime Fiction Academy, and I always tell my students to describe things really well. Describe things carefully. I want to see it. Show me. Show me. He has these two detectives coming to his house, um, and you know, he says, when I made an end of these labors, it was about 4 o'clock, still dark at midnight, as the bell sounded an hour, there came a knocking at the door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. We don't get their names, we don't get what they look like, we don't get what their voices sound like, we don't get anything about these men because we're so deep inside this guy's head and his own paranoia. And it, to me, it works. It's absolutely terrifying. I, you know, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's brilliant actually. So. Um, he, in an act of utter bravado, takes these three faceless, voiceless, nameless police officers, because what does he care, he's that narcissistic, into the room where he actually <laughs> killed the man, sits his chair down right on the spot where he buried him under the floorboards, and, you know, just smiles, when, you know, listens to them answer, answering all their, his questions. 
Then we get the sound. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what can I do? It was a low, and I love this description, it was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. This is the sound of the man's heart that he's hearing in his mind. The sound, all the sounds, are so much more carefully described, so much more vividly described, than anything about the place he's been living, anything about anyone he's been knowing. And then the only dialogue, the only dialogue in the entire story is the last lines. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the planks. Here, here is the beating of his hideous heart. And that's it. Uh, wow. That just shows my story, right? Um, so I love that story. And to me, you know, um, there would be no psychological suspense were it not for Poe. There would be no Thomas Harris were it not for Poe. The, the idea of, of getting inside the mind of a, of a mad person, the, the hearing that exactly what that crazy person was saying on the subway platform is so often more terrifying than any ghost story or any, any monster story that you could tell because it, there's something so real about it and he, he knows that, that crazy mind so well. Um, the Assignation, which I'll talk just really briefly about, uh, is another Venice story. And um, it's not a really famous story, but it's, I, I really like the, the romantic way in which it's written. Basically, it is about um, a, man, a narrator, another nameless narrator. This man, as opposed to the man in the, in the uh, Telltale Heart, has really nothing to do with the action. What he does is he happens upon the last scene of a romantic tragedy. Um, he is riding a, a gondola in Venice, the Venice the, the uh, gondola drifts towards a scene where an absolutely beautiful woman has dropped her baby into the uh, canal. It's, it's fall, she hasn't done it on purpose, but it's fallen out of her arms into the canal. Now, I just want to read that this one description because it's the most beautiful, evocative, lovely, romantic description of a drowning baby I've ever read. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to how peaceful this is. A child, slipping from the arms of its own mother, had fallen from the upper window of the lofty structure into the deep and dim canal. The quiet waters had closed placidly over their victim, and although my own gondola was the only one in sight, many a stout swimmer already in the stream were seeking in vain upon the surface, the treasure which was to be found, alas, only within the abyss. Mm -hmm. Upon the broad, black marble flagstones at the entrance of the palace, and a few steps above the water, stood his figure, which none who saw then could have since forgotten. And this is the Marchesa, this beautiful woman who he describes so gushingly and romantically as her baby's drowning. Okay? We, we have pages of this description. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, her eyes, her, her hair, everything about her. Um, and then a young man um, appears. Uh, out of nowhere, although she's been looking in this direction all along, jumps into the water, rescues the baby, gives it back to her, and she looks at him and she says, Thou hast conquered. Thou hast conquered. One hour after sunrise we shall meet, so let it be. But what she means by we shall meet is we're both going to kill ourselves because I'm married to this other old guy that I don't really love, and you're probably the father of this baby, even though we don't say it in here, but that's what I think. <laughs> and so then um, our narrator, who has met this guy four times, he says, um, goes over to the, the apartment of this young man. Um, he uh, sees all this beautiful artwork there. Yeah. Uh, the young man is talking somewhat distractedly, somewhat crazily. Um, he at last shows him a portrait of this absolutely beautiful woman, um, the Marquesa Aphrodite, the same woman who had dropped her baby into the, uh, into the canal. And, um, and he, this is rather interesting. I'm not really gonna comment on this last little bit here, but there's a bit of a double entendre, if not a single entendre, in the way he writes it. Um, but after he looks at the, you know, he's, he, to he gets a glass of wine, he toasts the picture of the, of the Marquesa, and then um, and, he, and he says, at last, erecting his frame, he looked <laughs> upwards and ejaculated the lines of the Bishop, Bishop of Chichester. <laughs> okay. Stay for me there, I will not fail to meet me in that hollow veil. And then he, then in the next instant, confessing the power of the wine, he threw himself at full length upon the couch. So this is, could be a parallel for something else, I'm <laughs> sure. But anyway, um, at that point, the page of the beautiful woman um, comes in, announces that his mistress is dead. Um, our narrator, who thinks 
you know, this young man has just passed out, tries to rouse him, and sees that he's dead too. He's poisoned himself. It's the end of this love story that he's just happened upon. And it's, it's very, uh, it's romantic and chilling at the same time, which is something that Poe does, I think, better than any other person. So, anyway. It's a suicide pact. Yeah, it's a suicide pact. Yeah. 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 I thought maybe the husband had managed to murder them both. That's not... Not well, that, that could be a possibility. He never comes out and said it. I took it to be because she said, "Thou hast conquered." Let's ah, meet, and then yeah. and, he, and this this phrase of the bishop, bishop of Chichester is, you know, basically saying, "We'll meet in heaven. I'll wait for you when I die, and, and I'll meet you there." It's this romantic. Yeah, it's it's a suicide pact. <laughs> I thought um, I thought you were going to speak of um, the the actual thoughts of the baby. <laughs> As it floats down in the canal, which, oh, yes, which yes. I objected to. Right. And, I mean, this is not what a drowning baby is going. Yeah. <laughs> Her first and only one, who now deep beneath the murky water was thinking in bitterness of heart upon her sweet caresses <laughs> and exhausting its little life and struggles to call upon her name. I think that baby is to say, I want to breathe. <laughs> Get me out of here. The, the narrator's clearly projecting. He really, he's really, he's like, if that was me, I'd just be thinking I'd be thinking, oh, that baby. <laughs> that baby's so lucky, just to help right up on it. Yeah, that's, that's right. Anyway, yeah, it's, I, they're just, they're such different stories, but there's such mm -hmm. sort of, it's a crazy intensity. Um, Telltale Heart uh, has always struck me as a really a dramatic monologue mm -hmm. because it'd be very easy to just stand up and recite the whole thing and then would it all turn out to be a perfect shape. I mean, you'd have to have lungs of leather and you'd have to, you know, you'd have, to have a bellow with it you read to really get it right bellows. But um, I mean, that's, that's part of what makes it so cool that, that it is just this. Uh, story ripped out of this character, or supposedly as if ripped out of this character, but uh, in a way formalized. Uh, absolutely, we're going we're going toward the ending right from the beginning, and there's a little foretelling of the ending when he, when he's in the bedroom, he's looking at the old guy <laughs> night after night after night. At one point, he hears his heartbeat. Yeah. And, and, and he rather likes that, you know? It um, means he's not awake, unfortunately. Yeah, the pacing's amazing. And actually, Poe's yeah. said, uh, which I wrote down because I can't remember anything. I'm like, <laughs> a short story must have a single mood, and every sentence must build, must build towards it. And that, it just seems like a perfect example That's a, of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a rather crippling aesthetic, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, uh, it, it works for a lot of people, and, uh, and I think there are some, um, you know, more than a handful of modern writers who, though with very different aesthetic, would kind of imply the same mm -hmm. thing. But it, it does, it means you, the whole story's on a little proscenium, mm -hmm. and you know, it just, it just unwinds like a clock, uh, like clockwork. Um, it's, it's, it's a very strange way to deal. It's, it's at such a pitch. Yeah. Is it? Well, it works for Poe, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's generalizing. He's saying, yeah. this, this is how my stories are constructed mm -hmm. and should be read all in one go. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then he commands every other story, story writer to do it in exactly the same way. Yeah. <laughs> now, Poe is very good at, these, uh, at the advice and prescriptions. I don't know if you've ever read um, his criticism. Have you ever uh, wandered into that? Rather, uh, he was he was vicious. He Absolutely. was vicious. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, and deadly, um, and in a way, completely false. I think um, you get the sense that here is a guy who's doing his damnedest to make at least a little money, and he's doing it in the worst possible way by assuming superiority. Over, over everybody else, in essence. He was sort of the first troll. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. He's, he's sitting there in a cottage in the Bronx, <laughs> set, setting out these poison <laughs> pen letters. Um, he also, there's something about the 
difference between the rational and the irrational that's really deep in Poe. Because he's always pretending to be really rational. Uh -huh. and, and there's a long piece he wrote about, about the writing of the Raven. The Raven was his first real success, and in a way his only big success. Uh, he kept trying to try, try repeat it ever after. But in order to bring a few more coins out of the way, bring a little bit more reputation, he wrote a very long essay about how the raven was constructed. And every single word of it is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> he, makes it, he makes himself sound like Pope. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's totally prescriptive, it's um, arrogant, it's arid. Mm. Nobody who read it thought, thought it was real. He, 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 he was much better in inventing fake rationality than in doing the real thing. <laughs> um, now, I, 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 picked the, I picked two stories. One is good and one is really dingy. Uh, well, they're both pretty dingy. Um, Berenice is, uh, uh, fits right in with the telltale heart, the fall of House of Usher, um, and, and, and with the cask of Amontillado. It's, a, it's, again, a, a story about a man who, if not mad at the beginning, becomes irretrievably mad. It's about a premature burial, um, or if not, no, not a premature, it's about an exhumation. Yes. An, 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 an unconscious exhumation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he uses the idea of trance, which, which I discovered well, I, I did an anthology for the Library of America called American Fantastic Tales, and uh, we tried to go as far back as we could into the uh, 19th century. There was very little from the 18th century, but back, at, back in the beginning, American writing was um, American prose fiction, of which there was very little, was uh, really obsessed with the notion of loss of self. They, they were terrified of mesmerism, they were terrified of trances, of anything that removed volition from the self. And, uh, Paul, Paul fits right into that particular uh, set of concerns. Um, Berenice is a totally crazy story. I, 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 I picked it for, the, uh, for that anthology because in a way it's poem pure form. And I think Usher is, and I think Telltale Heart for sure is. Um, I, I didn't pick the Telltale Heart only because everybody knows that story. Anybody who picked that, pick up that book would know that story very well. But um, Berenice isn't quite so well known, and it's, I think it's because the aberration of the fake rationalist at the beginning is so peculiar. Anyhow, he begins, he begins, uh, another thing I like about this story is that, is that it starts off in the realm of abstraction, where Poe was, uh, thought he had a great handle on everything, but, but, but in fact sounds as screwy as, 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 as he goes later on. The misery is manifold, the wretchedness of earth is multiform. Now we could say yes to that, actually, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a very strange way to start a story. Misery is manifold. Uh, out of joy is sorrow born. <laughs> um, and, and, and after that, this guy talks about his family, and he, he talks about himself. He is one of the, of the race of characters in Poe who are all like, they're all brothers, uh, except they have no brothers. Um, they, they are all pale, melancholy, uh, sickly, um, totally at home in fantasy, very ill at home in the real world. The real world, you know, is hardly admitted. First of all, as you said, there are all these curtains hiding the light. <laughs> and and the, 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 the places where they live are massive stone places with all the different uh, hallways and, and cellars. And so there's, there's very little, and they're servants. So there's very little reason actually to go outside, which gives us these guys yet another opportunity to read f fantastic books, to recite poetry to themselves, and to enter step by step into deeper and deeper screwiness. Um, <laughs> this guy, 
Well, first of all, he, he does say at the end of the introduction, in effect, he says that his only reality is fantasy, which I think maybe gives his report of what follows a little dubiousness, but <laughs> it's, so, it's so peculiar. Um, so he, he, he doesn't have a sister. <laughs> he has a, a cousin, Berenice, who is quite beautiful. He has an illness, this illness of melancholy, which uh, shades into a sort of weird, it's the reverse of a phobia. It's a monomania. He can only think of one thing at a time. And to him, this is the, uh, kind of, I think it's kind of a, a peak of, of rationality. He is so, his mind is so well developed that it must seize upon certain particulars in the world and dwell upon them, casements, windows, you know, clouds. Um, and he hasn't a choice. His, uh, his, his, his mind has mastered in this uh, uh, strange compulsion of his, which he, which he, which he sees as, as a, a kind of advantage. He also sees it as a disease. Um, uh, eventually he realizes that the things he focuses on are frivolous. Um, which means that he, he, the meditations were never pleasurable. So as, as, as things go along, he realizes that he's working himself into a kind of uh, desperation, a sort of blind alley in which the, the, the things that, because of the cast of his mind, he is forced to think about over and over and over are getting sillier and sillier of less and less real importance in the world. And yet, uh, he has no choice. Um, and then the cousin falls ill. Uh, formerly quite beautiful, of course. But now, um, her calamity indeed gave me pain and taking deeply to heart that total wreck of her fair and gentle life. He often ponders what, what undid her. Um, my, my, true to my own character, here's where he really begins to fly his flag. True to, True to his own character, my disorder reveled in the less important but more startling chains that wrought in the physical frame of Berenice, in the singular and most appalling distortion of her personal identity. Now, <coughs> he, he says, he, he, he's talking about her body, but her body is her personal identity. He's also saying that when she was very beautiful and he was this melancholy, Hamlet-like, uh, gloomy character, uh, that he never loved her. He began to love her, however, when she fell ill and uh, got less and less beautiful. There's, there's always in Cole a great attention on the forehead. Uh, he clearly thought large foreheads were attractive, except, and that this girl, yeah, I think so. <laughs> this girl's forehead unfortunately turns yellow, and so it's a little less attractive. Um, Anyhow, he begins to, uh, so what he does, when she's really, really emaciated and half dead, is he proposes marriage. <laughs> uh, and they, they get married, I guess. Um, but at the moment, he, begin, he notices something that ever afterwards he wishes he'd never see, and that is Bernice, Berenice's teeth. <laughs> Berenice's teeth are perfect. They're white. They're long. They are um, enamel. They're enamel. <laughs> they're, 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 they're sculptural. Um, her eyes are lifeless and lusterless. However, her lips parted in it, and the teeth of the chained birdies disclose themselves slowly to my view. Uh, the teeth! They were here and there and everywhere, visibly and palpably before me, long, narrow, and excessively white, with the pale lips writhing about them. Um, now this story is going somewhere. At this point, yeah, the, uh, in the multiplied objects of the external world, I had no thoughts but for the teeth. Anyhow, poor Bert Berenice um, expires. Uh, he's, 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 he's deep in the rapture of uh, a fantasy about the teeth and she she dies and is uh, interred 
she she'd been seized with epilepsy, and now the grave is ready, and all pre preparations for the burial were completed. And then there's a long silence. There, there, there's a lot of asterisks on the page, and a big uh, white uh, gap. And when that this, um, textual in interruption is over, he's sitting there, he's wondering what happened. Uh, he has no memory. Um, he, he had a confused dream. You know, the dream was rather horrible. Horror more horrible for being vague and terrible, more terrible from ambiguity. Uh, he, he has fantasies. I strive to decipher them in vain, while ever and anon, like the spirit of a decided, the departed sound, the shrill and piercing shriek of a female voice seemed, I guess it was premature barrel, <laughs> seemed to be ringing in my ears. Uh, and it seemed to him that he'd done something unspeakable. What was it? What was it? Um, he's sitting in the library, which is where he claims he was born, and where his mother died in this mm -hmm. library. So this kid was fated. He didn't have yeah. a chance. Um, then uh, a, 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 a person called a menial uh, enters. We are in, a, in Anthony Trollope, work of fiction. We know this, what this guy is wearing down to his buttons. But we, we, all we know is looks were wild with terror. And he spoke of a wild cry, and and he whispered of a violated grave of a disfigured body and shrouded, yet still breathing, still palpitating, still alive. And then he points with a shuddering finger at our boys, clothes and they're covered with mud, <laughs> and, and uh, clotted with gore. Um, and he's got a little casket, a little box on his desk, and um, he picks up with shaking hands. And drops the box, and you'll never guess what falls out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was. well here we go. <laughs> From it, with a rattling sound, there rolled out some instruments of dental surgery, <laughs> intermingled with 32 small, white, and ivory looking substances <laughs> that were scattered to and fro about the floor. There we are. The end. The end. The end. <laughs> 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 Yeah. It's, very, it's very weird, isn't it? It's very weird indeed. That's, that's the real poem. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like pure form, like a, like, like a telltale heart, except odder and grizzly. Uh, um, <laughs> more, and and, and Poe understands that the, this uh, narrator is fascinated with something inert, small, essentially meaningless. Um, there are other characters in fiction crazy homicidal people who are much the same. I'm thinking of Hanover Square. Hangover Square. Hangover Square. Yeah. And Patrick um, uh, Hamilton. Hamilton. Patrick right. Hamilton. Yeah, he's always yes, he's very saying, mad, I he? must kill Meta. Yes, he's <laughs> right. He has no idea why. Yes. And then he forgets. Yeah, he forgets. Uh, he forgets uh, it. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then it comes upon him again. Yeah. And then he's in a trance. Oh, he's he's at a golf club. And he's about to bash her brains out with a golf club. Yeah. And something happens, some little click goes up. Well, he doesn't know where he's standing there. <laughs> so, but he is, he is indeed a Poe yeah. creation. That's right. That's but, right. but there's a moment in this. You remember in uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness when yeah. Kurt says the horror, the horror, that famous line. Yeah. There's a moment here where, where this narrator says, the teeth. The teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to think that Conrad didn't sort of hear that and <laughs> realize how mad it yeah. sounded and, and trans translated directly into the heart of darkness. Was, was, was there a, an enthusiasm for Paul in England in the 1830s? 1830s? Um, so I would say that Dickens was influenced Me by too. Poe. Yeah. yeah, I think um, so. There is a character, is it in Bleak House, called Nemo, who is a drug addict, who uh, has very Poe-like characteristics. Yeah. He lives in a room, uh, and he's, um, yeah. he's an obsessive character. And after he dies, they, found all, they find all of these notebooks in his room, and in a very small, neat hand are just small numbers, and they are all... Uh, related to the, the uh, quantities of powder that measured in micrograms, <laughs> and it was his, he was, he was, he was actually accounting his habit yeah. as a junkie might. Yeah. And I, I thought it was a beautiful piece of insight on Dickens's part into the mind of an addict yeah. 
but it felt very much, and I do believe that he, he read Poe and was, uh, was very uh, taken by They faith. shared a common uh, harmony. The man, the man of the crowd is something The man of the crowd is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyhow, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a lovely story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're looking for a poll, there, there is this film, oh, audience time? Yes. Audience time. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what I was going to say to you, A plus. <laughs> <laughs> there is something about the, the like the fetishization of these of these the teeth or, or the eye and or, yeah. you know these things that you would never really focus on but once magnified are rather yeah. terrifying. You know. There is also excuse me. The, this is what I was going to say. There there is constantly an atmosphere that's very like uh, drug addiction and the results of drug addiction. All these strange, drifty, dreamy, out of the world. Yeah. Moments occasionally there are Lucian Sidrites. So for a long time people thought and said that Paul was not only an alcoholic but a drug addict. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I don't think he was and I don't think there's any... Is there no evidence, evidence of that? Hmm? There's no evidence there, of, there, of, there, of there, that. No evidence yeah. of that. We know who was a boozer, but we don't know yeah. anything. Yeah. Anybody have anything they'd like to address to the panel? Uh, I think it's very interesting that you've identified premature burial as really a thematic thread from so much of Poe. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, going back to the poem that interrupts the narrative in the, the fall of the House of Usher, I do remember reading criticism to the effect that what is described is not what the poem is called the haunted palace. Uh -huh. And it describes the building with two windows, a door, serenity comes through the door, beautiful light comes through the windows. And then this sort of cast of evil comes over the building and uh, the, the great Line, last lines are, you know, through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever right. and laugh but smile no more. What the critic really points right. out is that this is the human head of a man. Huh. That the door is the mouth, the two windows are the eyes, the banners become the hair in disarray, huh. and what comes out is blasphemy and kind of, you know, yeah. and, yes, slander, etc. Yeah. and so forth. The removal of the smile from Berenice, I think, is a way of breaking through the smile and getting to that kind of gaping horror, I think. Yeah. But I'm wondering, you know, are we meant to see perhaps the premature burial as the symbolist laid it interpreting Poe as symbolic? These people are buried within themselves by fear of madness, by fear of alienation, mm -hmm. feel of re religious hysteria, gender confusion, almost any number of, you know, psych psychotic uh, impulses. Mm -hmm. And particularly, um, the cast of Amontillado, I've often wondered if that's meant to be interpreted literally at all. Is he not, is the narrator, not walling up fortune, the fortune that has insulted him, the fortune that has evaded him. The fortune in other words, he, he's almost sort of burying hope in a way, yes. and in the end there's that chilling dialogue where Fortunato says, a noble joke. Yeah. And he is not afraid at all, yeah. and when he throws the, the torch in, he just hears the rattling of bells, almost as if the person has disappeared. Yeah. Has yeah. he really managed to bury that fortune, or is this another you know, psychotropic kind of attempt to kind of disassociate oneself from bad luck and from uh, kind of the evil of the world. If so, it's of course a failed uh, effort because we know this man is never going to escape uh, his, particular, his particular mindset. Exactly. Yeah. Forever finding injury. Yeah. Exactly. But that was good though. <laughs> <laughs> Something that almost all of those stories kind of It's said that the, the Gothic tradition is, is very much engaged with supernatural phenomena until Poe, and Poe turns it inwards. Uh, yeah. And that would, I think, the, the sense that he's dealing always and exclusively with, with the mind, possibly his own mind, yeah. uh, which is an imprisoned or walled up. Uh, a subterranean sort of thing, at least in his, uh, in his own reflection upon it, would, <laughs> so would feed into that. And there's a lot of yeah. tomb like inter Im imagery in general in Poe. I mean, even the, in this description of the homes and everything, that you could you could you know easily view that as they're described. They they all sound like mausoleums to me. You know, I mean, every everything 
it seems like, you know, being being buried, being buried within yourself, being buried in, well, I, I thought a clue to that story, particularly in Venice, was I was thinking to myself, what can't there be a lot of in Venice? Multi-story basements. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I wonder if Poe is trying to like indicate that already we are no longer dealing with the real Venice, that we're there at all. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, um, but he was there. We were discussing. Yeah, he, was never he was never there. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, he never left America. For never sure. left America. Yeah. 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 That actually reminds me of, of, of the, the adventure of Arthur Gordon Pym and the fact that he'd obviously never been to Antarctica and then it ends up influencing Moby Dick so profoundly and all of these kinds of the, the hallucinations about whiteness and stuff that yeah. end up influencing Melville. But I was wondering, um, Peter, when you were talking about the, the Library of America book, mm -hmm. if you could talk a little bit about the way in which then um, Poe's Gothic and gory exploration of the psychological then sort of became even more internal. If you think of Hawthorne, Melville, and then later Henry James and Turn of the Screw, and it, I was thinking of the Aspen Papers where you were talking about the huh. about uh, the assignation. Yeah, or, or what's what's that great one? Now? The, the Sacred Fount. Yes. Which is a, a beautiful novel in which nothing happens except the man inch by inch reveals himself to be totally crazy. Uh, he's imagined assignations and uh, sexual moments ha happening over and over, and he sees uh, psychic patterns changing. And he, at the end, he explains it to another guest, and the guest ends the novel by saying, "You're crazy." <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, there is. Uh, there has always been a streak in the Gothic, in fact, I think it's the most prominent streak, of melancholy, of loneliness, of loss. And to me, that, that's what makes the Gothic really worthwhile, that it does concentrate, gives full value to um, emotional conditions like that. Uh, uh, where, where I see the gore, emerging later is in, is in the pulps. Uh, there's no doubt that Lovecraft read Poe and uh, cared for him very deeply. And the, the pulps uh, rather cherished gore. The, uh, you know, and, that, and, and eventually that turned into DC comics that are like... Tales from the Crypt. Uh, Tales from the Crypt. Uh, they're, they're like pulp, uh, H.P. Lovecraft short stories in graphic form. Um, and they are, when, when it gets to that point, it's all about extremities. It's, it's all about uh, the, tail, the tail turning and the biter being bit. And, uh, uh, they're all very neat and programmatic, yet at, the, at their heart, completely nuts, absolutely filled with uh, imaginative violence. Um, Henry James <laughs> does not. Uh, fit this uh, cat category at all. I'm, um, though he is very focused on lost opportunity, on um, melancholy uh, protagonists, uh, on um, you know, the, the loss of love, the loss of hope, the, the renunciation the of love. The loss of innocence, or rather the, 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 the violation of innocence, yeah. the manipulation of the innocence. Yeah, exactly. And that's very, very Gothic. Uh, yeah. yeah. Five minutes? No, I'm just no. ready. I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask Alison, it's uh, kind of two reasons. One, the related questions. One, what do you think uh, crime fiction writers in particular have to learn from Poe? And two, do you see a profound influence on contemporary crime, crime fiction still from Poe? Uh, yeah, I do. I think especially in psychological suspense. Um, I think uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous, I mean, you know, before Poe there was no, Psychological suspense and also noir, you know, yeah. uh, the whole idea, uh, I mean, Telltale Heart, is a, it, that's a noir story right there, um, you know, it, it's it influenced Dostoevsky, which in turn influenced noir, um, where you realize the evil within yourself and, um, and then you, you pay for it in some way. Um, I think that, you know, 
I, I, on, I think that just the idea of what human beings are capable of versus, you know, a, a classic horror story involving ghosts or, you know, vampires or whatever yeah. is, is that's kind of born of Poe and that sort of translated, translates into crime fiction and the, and the type of thing that scares us about, you know, modern day crime fiction, the psychological element of it is to totally, you know, owes its debt to Poe, I think. Every time you read a killer point of view, that's somebody that, that has been influenced by Poe, yeah. you know. Um, anytime, any, any crime fiction at its best is a, is a look under that rock, and that's what Poe is. And I, I think, you know, he did that so well, and it, it influenced, you know, it, it will always influence crime, crime fiction. It influenced me you know, <laughs> when I was a kid, and I think most crime fiction writers, you know, when they're, that's their first sort of introduction to it, you know. Did he invent the detective? Is it Monsieur mm -hmm. Dupin? The first oh, right. sort of four yes. runner of Sherlock Holmes. Yes. 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 So the art of detection yes. is there in Poe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Before Inspector Bucket. Bucket. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's absolutely true. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, modern crime fiction owes a tremendous debt to Poe. Yeah. You know? yeah. They don't call them the Edinburgh Awards for nothing. That's <laughs> right. So, uh, and yeah. those, those stories feature the weird, obsessed rationality. Uh, that uh, is, is, is so characteristic of Poe. While you were speaking, I was thinking of Lawrence Block, mm -hmm. who's, uh, whom I, I would previously have not have thought of in this context. But there's a period in the, the middle novels of Lawrence Black that are breathtaking in their acceptance and embrace of violence. Mm -hmm. The, our our a wonderful hero, Matt Scudder, has a best friend who's actually a beast, a, a, a Westie, comes and goes around in a blood spattered apron that belonged to his father, and when he's going out to exact a bit of business, he carries a cleaver. And at one point, or maybe more than one of those novels, our hero goes with him. And our hero shoots somebody um, that he is not necessarily called upon to shoot. Uh, our That's hero cool. breaks moral rules all, all over the place. It's really... It's very true. Dance at the Slaughterhouse is one giant look under a rock. And yeah. it's, like, it's honestly the most bleak, horrifying... It's a yeah. wonderful book. I really like it. Wow. Yeah. You know, and, and the end, absolutely, which I'm not going to, you know, give away. Yeah. But, but um, right, it really, it, it just plums the depths of depravity, both in terms of, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's a first-person like, hero. And you, and you know what's like so what's so disturbing about that is it is a tremendously violent, exacting ending, and for the reader, so satisfying, and it yeah. makes you question yourself. <laughs> I yes. think Block was angry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he was <laughs> angry. He didn't give up. Yeah. Well, well, this chance has been waiting for so long. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I just want to bring up uh, the signature burial again. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's an important story. That was a huge. Is, I think it's uh, Paul's most autobiographical tale. Now, when he's discussing some volatility with that story, if you read the last paragraph, I'm not going to quote it, but if you read the last paragraph, what he's saying in essence is that when you're involved in this world of dark writing, or if you enjoy reading dark books or look at dark artwork, mystery, horror, it's very addictive. Once you're hooked, you can't get off of it. Uh -huh. That's exactly what he's saying with the premature burial. You know, Paul wasn't the type of man that wrote in his attic with, with bats flying around his around his head, yeah. but except for him being an alcoholic, he was very conservative. Mm -hmm. He was trying to make yeah. a living, he loved his wife dearly, he yeah. wasn't a, a crazy monster, but he had that side to him that was very effective and he couldn't shake it. Yeah. And that's exactly what he's talking about in the premature burial. <laughs> but one other thing I'd like to bring up, the Grolier Club on East 60th Street, yeah. they have a magnificent exhibit on Ed Gallant Hall. It's free to the public. It's one of the most amazing collections I've seen in my life. Wow. They include Tamerlane, another poem by a Bostonian. Yeah. That's on display. They have wood from his coffin, a lock of his hair. <laughs> it's actually an amazing, amazing collection. You have to see it, Tate. Yeah, no, it's a book. It has to be seen. It has to be seen. Okay. Uh, I think we've been. <laughs> <laughs> We're being prematurely buried. <laughs>